Okay, greetings and good, good afternoon to all. Thank you for accepting our invitation to this webinar title, Accessibility, You Are in the Driver's Seat, with our special speaker today, Professor Lindsay Foster from Tarrant County College, Connect Campus. Thank you all for your valuable collaboration with this initiative that at that intends to have the goal to provide special support to member institutions as part of the HEADS mission to promote the integration of technology in higher education. Today, we have more than 200 participants registered from more than 20 higher education institutions in Puerto Rico. Also, we have a participants from US from the US institutions, a uh, member of HEADS as well, and other organizations here in Puerto Rico and in the US. So we are very happy and pleased to have you here. Great greeting to all. And we hope that this webinar will be of great benefit to everyone. Before we start the webinar, as we usually do, we would like to share a few things. Let me make sure this, okay. First of all, uh, for your convenience, as I mentioned before, closed captions are available in English for this webinar. To activate this feature, you just click on the button uh, or on the side where you can find the, the different uh, buttons of the features of Zoom and click in the one that said closed caption live transcript button and then you select the, the language. English uh, is the one that we will be using today. And remember also to use the chat to share your questions and comments. And I already asked Lindsay if she is okay to interrupt, interrupt her during her presentation. So anything that you may want to clarify during the, her presentation, please feel free to write it on the chat. I will be uh, me and my staff that today we have Isaris gonna, uh, with us. Uh, Isaris, say hi, open your video. And we also have Diane uh, uh -huh. with us that she's, uh, Isaris is helping us uh, admitting the people and Diane is the one putting uh, the links on the chat. The, uh, the three of us will be pending if something happened, Bella, any questions, any comments to uh, interrupt Lindsay and let her know that there is a question. Also, keep your microphone on mute to avoid interruptions, interruptions during the recording of this webinar. We already uh, 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 try to well, I use the feature to unmute, uh, mute everyone when they enter, but it's, for example, out of the sudden, you can unmute yourself. Please make sure uh, to keep it mute so we don't have any interruptions. As uh, someone already asked, we, as usually, have the link to in the chat to request your certificate or participation. Also, you can use the QR code using your mobile. You can use uh, your camera to uh, uh, use the QR code to go to the form and please make sure your name and your email is correct before you submit the information so uh, we can be able to send you the certificate as soon as uh, Bella, as possible. Uh, let me keep the QR code there because uh, we started last webinar that we were able to uh, a, a have a new feature to do the certificates right away when we finish the webinar uh, in a PDF format. And we are very excited with that. And also we are able to put some content in the email that you will be receiving with the certificate at certificate as an attachment. So after we finish the webinar in two or at least give us, allow us two or three hours after we finish the webinar, you will receive an email with the certificate and also the link to complete a short electronic survey to help us evaluate this webinar and also to help us identify which head services and initiatives can support not only your faculty and administrators, administrators, but also your students and also your feedback to promote these services. These 
survey is anonymous and the estimate time to complete it is around five minutes. So please help us with this and we will appreciate your time to complete the surveys because your feedback is very important to us. Finally, we would like to invite you to and help us spread the word and invite others to our next webinars of this semester and events. And the next one will be right away tomorrow, 27 uh, October 27, at the same uh, time, 3 to 4, 3 p.m. Eastern time. It's going to be via Zoom as usually. And this will be in Spanish. And the title is Integración de la Biblioteca en Plataformas de Educación a Distancia a Través de Objetos de Aprendizaje. This time we will have Professor Purísima Centeno from the University of Puerto Rico sharing this very important topic with us. Remember, you still have time to register. You just need to go to heads.org and in next events you will find all the events and you will have you can access the link to register also we would like to remind you that you still have time if you have a project with your colleagues up to three presenters per proposal will be admitted for the best practices showcase that will be held in January 11 and 12 in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, but the deadline to submit your proposal and be evaluate, uh, Bella, and allow our committee to evaluate your proposal will be November 6, 2023. If you need additional dates, please let us know, but please make sure that you don't miss the opportunity to share your expertise and very pertinent projects and share your best practices with other institutions. Also, we are so happy to have a new partner, corporate partner, that is Teach Access. And this time they will be sharing with us the topic born accessible addressing the accessibility skill gap through curricular transformation. And for this topic will be, uh, the day will be November 9th at the same time, three. But this time, remember that the uh, Puerto Rico doesn't change the, the time zone, but it, in the States is a change uh, that will be November 5th. So November 9th for Puerto Rico will be 3 p.m., but for the Eastern time will be 2 p.m. So make sure you don't miss uh, this uh, change of the time zone so you can connect at the right time. And Kate and Rolando from Teach Access will be addressing this interesting topic. Also, we would like uh, to request your support to uh, help us invite your students to participate to the Student Experience Summit with a lot of our local members institution and also other members from the US and including Colombia. Uh, our <clears throat> member in Colombia, Universidad Cooperativa de Colombia will be here with us in that event that will be in November 14 and 15 in the Convention Center in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And this summit, have the goal to not only showcase the academic uh, programs of our institution, but also have experiential pavilions, concurrent workshops, and plenaries about the industry and education. So it's totally free. Bella is free of charge. So they just need to register and go there and visit either on November 14 or November 15. They have until uh, between 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. to be part of this event. And also in December 1st, we will have another webinar more focused uh, for students with Dr. Alva Troche from Interamerican University in Bayamón, talking about uh, leadership, liderazgo para los que buscan marcar la diferencia. This will be during the morning, 10 a.m. Puerto Rico time, that will be uh, 9 a.m. for uh, the Eastern time, okay? Very important to make sure that after November 5th, make sure you have the correct time zone. Also, we invite you to help us promote the to your students and colleagues the access to the Peterson Fest Prep, where you can find scholarship from technical community college up to master and doctor's degree, also practice tests and download the ebooks to prepare for those tests like the PCAT, ELSA, DRE, that among other resources. And remember that it's very easy to access the Peterson. You just go to the student placita, 
click on the Peterson test prep and look for the name of your institution and click in the name of your institution and put the password. If you don't know the password, please send us an email to info at heads.org with the name of your institution to provide you the proper password. The same access or password applies for the Peterson Career Prep, but this database is more into search for jobs and internships, create, have very nice uh, templates to create your resume, cover letters, and also find a lot of information about career advice among other services. And the steps are the same, but this time, instead of Peterson Test Prep, click on the link Peterson Career Prep, Prep, excuse me, click on the name of your institution and the same password for the Peterson test prep, apply for this database. Uh, if you don't know the uh, uh, password, please send us an email and, or call us to our office and we will love, uh, we will be pleased to give you that information. Also remember to follow us in the social media we have account uh, on linkedin on instagram twitter facebook and also everything that we offer including this webinar will is recorded and is uploaded in the he uh, youtube heads channel but also you will find the repository of our, all of the recordings in the next and past events menu and you will find everything there okay now we are ready to start our webinar today, but please let us first uh, read a brief summary of the our special invitee today, uh, our speaker today, Professor Lindsay Foster. Lindsay has over two decades of educational experience as an elementary classroom educator, a technology application instructor and instructional technology coach and coordinator and also instructional designer. As an instructional design, designer, Lindsay specializes in issues related to regular and substantive interaction and accessibility. And she was a TCAEA technology administrator of the year finalists, finalists in 2022 2021, excuse me, and she served on the 2021 TIA State Board of Education, Technology Applications, Text Review Committee. She has presented at local, state, regional, national, and international conference on a variety of educational technology and accessibility topics. And we are pleased to welcome her. Let me stop sharing my presentation. So, uh, Lindsay can start share hers and start uh, Bella, giving the presentation today. So welcome, Lindsay, and thank you for say uh, just when we invite you to share this important topic with us. Thank you so much, Akelbis. Um, You guys have a lot going on. I didn't realize how much you had going on. I'm really excited. Um, I am going to share my screen. Um, the presentation will be uploaded to the HETS website. Um, if it's not already available, I know that you Kelbis will share it, but I will also share a link if you would like to get a copy for yourselves to use at your institution. Um, please feel free, just give credit. Um, so I'm going to share. Yes, we will share it along with the link to the recording. It will be the link to download your presentation. But if you want to, Bella, anyone that may want to take advantage right away, on the chat, you can download it as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm sharing my screen. And as you Kelbis mentioned, um, if you have questions, please do ask them in the chat. Um, I encourage you to ask as we're going along if you have those questions. So this is accessibility, you're in the driver's seat. Uh, and the car that you see on the screen, the little VW bug is the logo that we use for our Tarrant County College Connect Campus Accessibility Roadmap. That's the plan that we have as an institution to become fully accessible and compliant with accessibility, uh, digital accessibility requirements by the year 2025. So you're going to see that this presentation has a lot of cute little cars in it, um, and it's all themed toward this program. But Quite often from my faculty, I get the question, why do we need to provide accessibility? So let's just take a little quick road trip on the why we need to provide accessibility, particularly this 
uh, presentation is going to focus on digital accessibility, but these principles still apply um, in face-to-face -face classrooms as well as online classrooms. So the information that you see on the screen is from the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, from the United States. And these statistics are available on their website. So they say that um, there are about 12.1% of the U.S. population has mobility issues. Those are things related to um, serious difficulty walking or climbing stairs, use of canes, um, potential wheelchair users. Those kinds of things are all related to mobility. Um, and there's about 12.1% of the population that has that. About 12.8% of the population has a cognition related issue. That could be serious difficulty concentrating, remembering, or making decisions. It could also be things related to ADD, ADHD, um, dyslexia, those kinds of things, processing those kinds of issues as well. About 7.2% of the U.S. population has an independent living challenge. Those are difficulty uh, with doing things such as errands by themselves, particularly if you think of the elderly population. That's a very challenging thing for a lot of folks. Um, when they're elderly, they have issues getting to the store or maybe um, getting to church and they need someone to drive them because they're, they're not safe driving. So those are all independent living related. About 6.1% of the U.S. population has a hearing challenge. That could be deafness. It could be hard of hearing. It could be serious difficulty hearing. Um, it could be people who use hearing aids. It might be people who need hearing aids and don't use them. About 4.8% of the U.S. population has a vision impairment. Um, that could be that they're fully blind or they have some sort of vision impairment such as cataracts or they have peripheral vision issues or glaucoma. Um, some of those things can be surgically repaired, other things cannot. But again, you know, you probably know someone who wears glasses or hearing aids. And then finally, about 3.6% of the U.S. population has self-care issues, difficulty dressing or bathing. Now, sometimes those things are temporary, like perhaps you have a broken arm or you have a broken leg and you can't, you have to change the clothing that you wear because you can't fit clothing on. I recently um, had my leg in a boot because of an Achilles injury and I had to wear a uh, wide-legged pants and pull-on pants because I had trouble with buttons and things like that. So that's kind of why accessibility. But I do find that it is important to remember that um, additionally, whoops, um, uh, when you're talking about accessibility, you're really talking about three different categories of accessibility. A lot of times I hear the phrase, never have I ever had a student who had an accessibility need in my class, or never have I ever had a student who had an accessibility need that I've known. And the reality is, is that probably you do know someone or you will know someone who has an accessibility need. There are really three different categories of accessibility, and I really love this graphic from Microsoft. Um, this is from their inclusive design uh, site and section, um, and it categorizes the accessibility needs into permanent, temporary, and situational, and it also lists them by um, four different types of sense, touch, sight, hearing and speaking. So an example of a permanent touch disability would be that you um, have lost an arm. Um, a temporary touch disability might be that you have an arm injury, that broken arm, or maybe you have a sprain, or maybe you have some sort of repetitive injury like carpal tunnel. And situational might be that you're a new parent. We have a lot of young parents um, and new parents at our campus at Connect, and we have um, those parents have needs they're holding toddlers, they're holding babies, maybe their arms are occupied. Uh, for sight, a permanent disability would be um, blindness. An example of a temporary disability might be cataracts because it could potentially be um, resolved through surgery or wearing glasses. And um, a situational sight would be a distracted driver, someone looking at their phone, someone bent over um, adjusting the heat or the radio in their car. Again, with hearing. Um, a permanent situation would be um, deafness or hard of hearing, but you might be temporarily having your hearing infected by an ear infection. Or um, I recently flew and my ears um, due to air pressure were clogged. And until they equalized, I had trouble hearing. Or if you're in a loud environment, like something with a bartender where they're shaking and you have background noise, that could be situational. And then finally with speaking, um, you have a permanent disability or permanent challenge of those who are nonverbal. Um, remember that uh, as you we're using these terms, 
remember that we want to be person first. And I recently met someone who was on the autism spectrum who identified herself as non-speaking, not non-verbal, because she said, I have words. I just wasn't able to express them until she received technology um, in the form of an iPad where it speaks for her. She enters the words that she wants to say, and then the iPad actually um, voices those for her. So nonverbal is one of those things that maybe we should be using non-speaking terminology. Again, um, that temporary situation is laryngitis, where maybe you have a throat infection or you've caught a cold and you've lost your voice temporarily. And then um, situational might be someone who speaks with an accent. For those of you who are native Spanish speakers, uh, I might have a very interesting accent. I grew up in the North and I now live in the South. So my family says I sound like I'm from Texas and my um, Texas friends say I sound like I'm from Michigan where I was raised. So just remember the keep those things in mind. Um, we're going to be discussing today the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines or WCAG or WCAG. And uh, they have three levels. This stoplight is not indicative of anything that they use. I just like to use it to show the three different levels. The base level or the what's represented by the green light is level A. That is the minimum standard that everyone should meet. The double A standard or the represented by the yellow light is a recommended level. That is the level that we should be aspiring to and should reach for. And then the red light is triple A. Um, it is the highest level. I say that this is the most expensive level um, with regard to manpower and budgeting um, because it can be quite costly to implement some things for accessibility. So when you look at the triple A level here at TCC in our roadmap, we uh, attempt to achieve AAA when it's feasible for us, either um, fiscally or with our manpower, but we are attempting to reach that AA level. And I will point out where we are um, with A, AA, or AAA levels. Uh, the five areas that we're going to talk about today are text, headings, hyperlinks, lists, and images. You'll notice that on the back of the car, there's also captions. I'm not going to get into captions today. That's a whole nother presentation and another um, topic to talk about. But these are the six areas that we identify here at TCC as our super six is what we call them. Um, those are the six things that we can ask our instructors and our staff and faculty to make micro changes with what they're doing because they're very easy things to fix and to make their materials, their communication, and everything that they're doing accessible. All right, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to tell you the WCAG success criterion, and when you have the presentation, the criteria are hyperlinked so that you can read them. So this is 1.4.8 on visual presentation. It is one of those AAA standards. I think this is one of those areas where we can reach that highest level. It's very, very doable. It um, talks about for visual presentation and blocks of text, you have to um, have a mechanism that allows you to achieve the following, that the foreground and background colors can be selected by the user. That's that dark background versus a light background that you can change maybe on your phone or on your, on your computer. Um, the text is not justified. That means that you're not using that um, those straight lines in things like Word or Google Docs to make the text go, go evenly across the page. You're actually left justifying text or right justifying text depending on the type of text you're using. The line spacing is at least a space and a half between the paragraphs and it's one and a half times larger than the line spacing. And that the text can be resized without assistive technology up to 200%. You wanna be able to have, that, um, have those responsive things on your mobile devices as well as your laptops. So let's just take a look really quickly at some fonts and we'll talk about which kinds of font choices that we can use. For accessibility in digital documents, and this is just a general rule of thumb, it's very, very good. It's not just for those using screen readers, but also students who have ADD, ADHD, students who are um, second language learners, uh, students with dyslexia, all of those areas. It really benefits them to use a sans serif font. Now, the top two fonts, Lexan Deca and Amatic SC, are both examples of sans serif fonts. The next two examples, Cedarville Cursive and Mystery Quest, are examples of serif fonts. Serif fonts usually have like little 
um, markings on the ends of letters like A's, Y's, S's, and R's. Um, additionally, when you're talking about font, it's not just about the font choice, it's also about the font size. You'll notice that the fonts at the top are much larger than the fonts at the bottom. The fonts at the bottom are much smaller. It is much more difficult to read a smaller font. And if I took off my reading glasses right now, I can tell you I would not be able to read those fonts on the bottom. So one of the um, things that you should be aware of is that a general rule of thumb, this is not any guideline, but it is a rule of thumb, is that on a document, print should be no less than 12 point font. And on a presentation, print should be no smaller than 18 point font for readability purposes. So kind of keep that in mind. That does not have to do with footnotes or end notes or things like that. This is talking about text spacing. Again, I'm showing you an example. The top example is space and a half spacing. The bottom example, I've, I've tweaked the spacing down to about a, um, less than one space. Um, you'll notice that it's much easier to read that top. How easy is this text to read? Examine the spacing between the lines. When you play with the spacing to try and get information all onto one page, you are forcing a tool like a screen reader to try and differentiate between letters. And you'll notice that in the bottom example, some of the letters are bleeding together. That can make it very difficult for someone who has dyslexia to read it. It can be very, very difficult for someone using a screen reader to read it. So you want to be careful with that and try to stick to that one and a half spacing. Again, another thing that you want to be aware of is the use of color and color contrast. You can put dark text on a light background. You can put light text on a dark background. But you should refrain from using monochromatic color schemes um, with backgrounds and text combinations or red-green. You'll notice that I used red print with a green highlight. And the contrast should be at least 4.5 to 1. Um, I used a gray on gray to indicate that monochromatic color scheme. And I use black on white, uh, white on black, and black on this light blue, um, because there's actually research that indicates that using black on white is stressful to the eye and can cause some cognitive load. So you want to be aware of that as well. But it can be very, very difficult. About 10% of the male population um, has a color deficiency, formerly known as color blindness. Um, and the most common form of colorblindness is red-green. So you want to be really careful and avoid that using those color combinations. Um, let's talk about headings, using headings and creating lists and documents and in your digital pages. Uh, WCAG success criterion 2.4.6 has to do with headings and labels. It is one of those AA standards, and it says that headings and labels describe a topic or a purpose. And WCAG success criterion 1.3.1 talks about information relationships. It's a level A standard. Um, and this helps, it doesn't specifically address lists, but it's related to lists. When you have items that look appear in a list, you should use an ordered or unordered list to help convey the relationship. So when you're talking about headings, you should use headings to organize the content. Um, they should assist those with using screen readers and other accessibility tools in the page with their document navigation. If you think about when you're reading a page, you regularly look for headings, you look for bolded words and italicized words so that you can skip to the content that you need. You're gonna skip from headings to subheadings. You need to apply those same headings and subheadings in your documents so that those who are using screen readers can skip through those pages and not have to listen to a half a page be read to them when they need to skip to the middle of the page. Additionally, user apply headings in numerical order. You'll notice that in most tools, um, they, they're numbered heading one, heading two, heading three. Heading one should be first. Anything that is um, a subtopic of heading one should be heading number two. Anything that's a subtopic of heading two should be heading three, et cetera. I'm about to show you a graphic. So how does that look? Well, I've used some font type to show you what a heading one is. That's represented by H1 is the coding in the carrots. Um, and you can kind of see the structure. H1 is the title or what's most important. H2 is a subtitle or what's next most important. H3 is a subheading. It's not as important, but it's still important. And then anything that's a paragraph would be P. And if you think of something like Russian nesting dolls or Matryoshka dolls, um, that fit within each other. 
Heading four, all heading fours are going to be topics underneath heading three. All heading threes are going to be topics under heading two. And all heading twos are going to be topics under heading one. Um, there are individuals who say that your document should only have one heading one, and then everything else should be a two or higher. But I don't follow that particular rule. So this is an example of what a page might look like using that heading structure. You'll notice that the title is the most important item. It's a type of literature. Um, I have one heading two, that's the subcategory or subtitle, it's fictional literature. I have a heading three, folk literature, that's a subcategory of fictional literature. And then I have two heading fours, fairy tales and tall tales. Underneath fairy tales, I have a paragraph about Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And underneath tall tales, I have a paragraph about Paul Bunyan. Um, and you'll notice that um, I got that information from Wikipedia, by the way. But you can see how each one of those categories is a subcategory of the next. You can have multiple headings on a page and it will help folks jump. So if I had another section on, let's say, um, mystery literature as part of fictional literature, and the student wanted to read about mysteries, they could skip over folk literature and jump to that. Again, um, let's talk a little bit about lists. I like to use the duck rule. Um, if you remember a rubber duck, if it looks like a list and it's organized like a list and it sounds like a list, you should organize it as a list. Or if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's a duck. Um, so these are examples of some items, these screenshots at the top of things that are lists. There are two different kinds of lists. There is an ordered list, which is a numbered list. Uh, you'll see that each one of these examples has a numbered list. The example on the far left actually has a numbered list within a numbered list. And the example in the middle also has that. The example on the right is combining numbered lists and, and unordered lists or lists that use bulleted points. You would use an ordered list when you're thinking about something that has steps, something that has to be done in a specific order, something where it's really important that you follow in a sequence. For example, directions on how to complete something, um, steps in a recipe on how to cook or create um, a meal, um, steps on an assignment on how to complete the assignment or turn something in. If it doesn't matter the order in which you do something, like say a grocery list or just a list of random websites, you can use an unordered list, which is a bulleted list. These are all examples of bulleted lists that we have. I do want to point out that in the example in the middle, we have, um, I'm going to talk about URLs in just a minute, but we have an example of a long URL here. Um, and I'll talk about why we don't do that. But you can see that I have these bulleted lists and it doesn't really matter what order my campus resources appear in. Um, I just need to know that those are all campus resources or my course formatting tip sheets, which is the example on the left. WCAG Success Criterion 2.4.4 talks about link purpose. And as I mentioned, that last example that I showed had a big long URL on it. This is a level A. Everybody should be doing this. This is the minimum standard. The purpose of a link can be determined from the link text alone or from the link text together with its pro programmatically determined link context. So if you can determine what the link means based on the context around it or from the words that are forming the link, that's what we want to do. So for example, I've blown up that example from that previous slide to show you that the link on the top is this really long URL that begins with HTTPS. A screen reader will read this letter by letter aloud to the individual. Each character gets read aloud. Screen reader users also have the ability to pull a list of links out and create a separate document that will tell them all the links that are on a page. If you use terms like click here, or link, um, they're going to get a page full of click here, click, 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 link, instead of what we want, which is the example on the bottom, respond to student resources, live chat help for respondents, Canvas classic quizzes, Canvas new quizzes, the VDI, and how to log into the VDI. So it's really important that you use those purposeful language terms in order to frame your links. 
So when you're creating hyperlinks, use the link option offered in the tool. I've taken some screenshots. Um, this example on the lower left is from Google. Um, you can see that it says link and it says you can use control K. The example immediately to the right of that is from Word. There's an insert ribbon and you'll notice that it looks like two little chain links linked together. That's the link option. And then above that is an example from Canvas LMS, which shows you that same little different kind of chain link with external and course links. You can also, when you're doing links, you can highlight the text and hit Control K on Windows or Command K on a Mac to, um, to pull that window up. You should avoid using phrases such as click here, click for details, find out more here, learn more, more, read more, the link below, the following link, just use the word. So if you're talking about going to the library, um, you should specifically say the library. And this is an example of a document that we actually had in a meeting. Um, the example on the left that's with the white background is what it was before we applied the same accessibility policies that I just talked about. The example on the right is what it looks like after we applied that. So you notice that the heading, how to transition from paper to digital on the right is much easier to read. Um, you know where you're going because we've applied that rule about um, purposeful context to the link, TCCD, knowledge base, transferring paper files to digital. And then you'll also notice that um, the list, I've applied a bulleted list rather than using dashes to try and create a list. Lots of tools and in, in digital tools don't recognize those dashes as a list. And if you use the format um, of a list, it will actually announce to a screen reader that they have a list of however many items and tell them where they are in the document. So that's really helpful. Uh, let's talk really quickly about images uh, and the purpose of alternative text or alt text. WCAG success criterion 1.1.1 addresses non-text content. I want to point out this is the very first thing that they addressed when they created the WCAG success criterion. That's how important it is. It is a level A standard. That means that it's something that we all need to be doing. All non-text content, that's images and graphics, that is presented to a user has a text alternative that serves the equivalent purpose. And then there are... Um, six situations where you don't have to, but I will say that input controls, time-based media, which is multimedia, testing, sensory, and CAPTCHA, as well as um, marking something as decorative, those are pretty much, those are situations that we all know about. We all know how hard CAPTCHAs are to read. But when we talk about offering alt images, um, we need to use this alt text decision tree. This is something that I have found to be very successful with my faculty. Uh, it's really, really helped them in determining if we need to include alt text. So it requires two questions. The first question is, did you include an image? If the answer is no, then you don't have to provide alt text because there's no image to describe. If the answer is yes, you have to ask yourself a second question. And that question is, what is the purpose of this image within this document, this post, this email, whatever it is that you're creating? If the purpose is to provide information or to provide educational content, you must include alt text. If it's decoration, if it's the border on your newsletter and it's because it's fall, you put pumpkins or it's Halloween, you can mark it as decorative, but you really need to ask yourself, why are you including it? Is it necessary? Um, lots of times I get the question about what is the suggested length for alt tags? Many tools will limit you um, to how many characters you can put in an alt tag. I know in Canvas LMS, it's about 120 characters, but if you run out of characters, you can always do long descriptions. Um, you do need to consider the context of your images as you are talking about that purpose of information or educational content. So let's just take a look at something really quickly. This is an example of our campus president, Dr. Elva LeBlanc. Um, and these are three different types of alt text that might be provided based on context. In the left example, we have just a general, a Hispanic woman with brunette hair wearing a blue blouse, white blazer, and a strand of pearls and pearl earrings. That's just general information that describes what Dr. LeBlanc looks like. In the middle example, this is from the local news. 
um, the alt text might read Dr. Alva LeBlanc, named chancellor by the TCC Board of Trustees. Actually, this picture was taken from a local story about the fact that Dr. LeBlanc had been named our chancellor, and that was the purpose of them including the picture. So that's why we're identifying her. And on the far right, um, this was from a website where we were talking about Hispanic serving institutions, which TCC is. Um, this might be the alt text that you see. HSI, Dr. Elva LeBlanc, a Hispanic Women's Services Tarrant County College District Chancellor. So all of those are appropriate alt texts um, for this image, but they all serve a different purpose. So before you ask, are we done? We're going to get to play a really quick game. Um, I'm going to ask you to do something in the chat and we're just going to see how we do. So I want, what do you think of when I say the word RAM? I want you to just think really quickly, what's the picture that you get in your head? And now I'm going to ask, uh -huh. and now I'm going to ask you to type that in the chat. Okay, you, you can check the check on Mela. You are able to see the check, Lindsay? Um, I'm going to check the chat in just a minute. Yeah. Um, okay. These are the two well, things let's... I think of when I see RAM. <laughs> Did anybody think of these things? <laughs> <laughs> the Dodge RAM on the left that's red or the sheep RAM on the right. When you hear the word RAM, um, you might have thought of something else. Um, but those are the kinds of things I think of. So let's try another one. Oh, I didn't right. know that that was a ram. <laughs> All right, here's here's the word Mustang. So what do you think of when I say Mustang? This one I know. Um, and I may have already um, implanted in your brain by talking about the fact that it's cars, the image on the right, the Ford Mustang car. But these horses on the left are horses. wild Mustangs. So yeah. I've I've had people say, I didn't know that Mustangs were horses. Yep, they are. They're a specific type of wild wild horse. All right, one more. Explorer. Oh, <laughs> I ruined it. <laughs> um, so the image that we have on the far left is an explorer. We know he's an explorer because he's wearing a pith helmet. I have a Ford Explorer car in the middle. And then I have Dora the Explorer on the far right. Because <laughs> um, I just had to do Dora the Explorer because every time I say Explorer, um, I have to sing I'm the map. All right, so I wanted to provide you some really quick resources. These are all hyperlinked in the presentation. Uh, the, the resources on the far left are all for uh, checking accessibility. These are tools that you can use to get you help started if you don't have someone who's doing accessibility work at your institution or you need some help. Um, Wave is a really great um, extension that you can add to Chrome or Edge or um, Firefox that really helps you. There's some color contrast checkers. There's one for color blindness called Color Oracle that I really, really love. In the middle, I have some examples of some resources that I've created for TCC, including our ABCs, our accessibility basics for our Connect Campus staff. That is actually for our staff. Those are resources that we we developed that helped guide them in those WCAG standards. There's also an accessibility digital resources checklist and um, a WCAG cheat sheet. I will point out that if you're going to use checklists, remember that just because you've checked it off on the checklist doesn't mean that you found all the accessibility issues that you may encounter and you may still be need to fix some things and be out of compliance. And then over on the far right, these are all things related to screen readers. The top two JAWS, um, Jobs Access with Speech and Non-Visual Desktop Access and Vita are the two um, industry standards. They do have freer or freemium versions, but generally speaking, you need uh, a subscription for those. Orca is um, open resource software that you can download. And then on your personal devices or your work devices, if you're like, I don't know what something sounds like on a screen reader and I just wanna know what it's gonna sound like. If you have Microsoft Windows, they now have a screen reading tool called Narrator. You can type in your Cortana search, which is that little magnifying glass in the lower left-hand corner. You can type the word Narrator and actually open it up. On Apple devices that run iOS, so on your iPhones and your Macs, you have Apple VoiceOver. And on Chrome devices like Chromebooks, if your students have Chrome devices, there's a tool called Chromebox. Um, and so those are all free, Narrator, VoiceOver, and Chromebox, and they're all accessible to your students. So if you have students who need um, a speech to a text-to-speech tool, those are really, really great, and they're 100% free. 
Um, I did want to leave time for any questions. Um, if you have questions and you're not and that you come to them later, I've put my email on the slide. It's lindsay.nicholsfoster at tccd.edu. If you want a copy of this presentation and not is the PDF that HETS is providing and you actually want to share this um, and use it to train folks at your institution, um, you can go to bit.ly drive to access, or you can scan that little QR code in the lower right-hand corner and um, you can get a copy of the presentation. Please don't change the mm -hmm. graphics, but feel free to use the information. But I'm going to stop sharing and I'm just going to see if there are any questions. Of course. Oh my God, we have a hundred people connected. So this is the time. Thank you, Lindsay. I love this exercise. It was kind of uh, interesting to realize that a work can mean different things. And it's very important because probably sometimes we well, I don't notice. Uh, let me, Lee, Lee says the resources is when the design is realized for change in all aspects. I don't know if, the, I, I guess this is a comment. I don't know Sounds if you want like to comment, but last, if you want to say something else regarding this topic, let me see. Excellent presentation is what I see. Excellent. Let me see someone else. I see image, color, phone, etc. That was regarding the questions you said before, and then you see everybody has a reply car horse uh, when you show the Bella the. I see the, Jessica's comment which, about the nesting dolls. That has really uh -huh. helped my faculty understand how to set up heading hierarchy. I had to come up with an, a visual example that they were familiar with. And I was like, oh my gosh, Rus Russian nesting dolls, the little dolls fit inside the bigger dolls. And it gave them something really tangible that they could um, grasp. And it made that so much more concrete for them. So yes, that is absolutely, an ex it made it so much easier. Also that different types of disability. Um, there is a book out there uh, and demystifying disability. And the author point makes the point that if you live long enough, you will experience some form of disability. Typically it's gonna be a mobility issue, a vision issue or a hearing issue or a combination thereof. Um, you're gonna either need to use a cane or a wheelchair because you're gonna, you're gonna get more, it's gonna be more difficult for you to move and walk or you're gonna lose your vision and you're gonna to have to wear glasses or you're gonna lose your hearing and you're gonna to have to get hearing aids. So if you live long enough, you're gonna experience those things. Great. Also, uh, Alvaro says very relevant information and easy to implement. Definitely, totally agree, agree with you. It also mentions color highlights, etc., are appealing to those with visual intelligence, makes learning fun too. Another comment. Any other questions? This is the time for Lindsay to reply. We still have uh, around eight minutes. Uh, so please. Take advantage of her experience. I will. Uh, I, go ahead. Us, I will say that um, we've come out with our campus accessibility roadmap, our car, and um, a lot of folks ask how we're going, how it's going, and where we are in our process. And I equate it to if you've ever done that, um, the fitness program, Couch to Five K where they say, you know, you get up off the couch and then you're going to run a 5K and, you know, they kind of work you through that process. We are off the couch, but we are not yet running a 5K. Um, <laughs> we are, okay, we are somewhere, <laughs> we're, we're somewhere, um, we're ahead of the people who are still sitting on the couch, but you uh -huh. need to remember, it's really important when you look at these things, it can be very overwhelming saying, oh my gosh, I'm yes. not doing this and I'm not doing that. And Lindsay mentioned six things, pick one and focus on one. And then when you get really good at that one, pick up the next one and then focus on that. That's why in our campus accessibility roadmap, we chose to focus on these six things that we can work on with all of our faculty. Um, our goal by 2025 is to have 100% of our full-time faculty and our staff trained in how to do these six things and about 75% of our adjunct faculty because we have approximately 600 adjuncts and there's a mobile population there. Some of them teach for us some of the time and some of them don't. So acknowledging that we're never gonna get to 100% because we're always gonna have some turnover and we're always gonna be have to be training folks. 
um, but 100% of our full-time faculty and staff is where we are. Mm -hmm. And we are currently at about, um, we just reached our goal for our first phase, which was to get fit to 50%, and we're actually over 50%. So I'm really excited that within the first year, we've already met that first goal, um, and we've, we're working toward meeting those goals. And we do offer training to our faculty. It's self-paced, and they get to take these things. It takes about three hours um, for them to work through it. So I'm happy to share that as well. Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing this. And also I see on the chat that Jessica asked, do you follow the 120 character limit for all texts? Our Canva accessibility checker always marks a test description longer than that's a problem. That is a problem, Jessica. You're right. And we use Canvas as well. Um, I recently worked this past spring on a geology class. And let me tell you, describing doing long descriptions of things like the geologic time scale um, for a student. You cannot describe that in 120 characters. So what we do, the choice that we've made as an institution is that we offer a basic description that fits within 120 characters. And within that 120 characters, we say that the long description is linked below the image or next to the image, we tell them where to look for the hyperlink. And we actually add a page in our Canvas courses that's titled long description. And then that description, we offer either a bulleted list or a table, um, whatever is appropriate to provide that. We're working on our STEM topics in particular are very, very difficult to do accessibility on. And I have an entire presentation where I do nothing but images of, of and we practice complex and long descriptions. And it, it can get, it can get hairy, but yes, that 120 characters can be very, very challenging. But one way that you can solve that is to just hyperlink a page or a document that's a longer description that offers that information. Excellent. También, eh, 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 also, eh, Lee said that for the implement, for the implement of this process is to practice, to practice and to read. Um, beginner, the implementation is other websites. Excellent. She said, and Jessica said, also smart. That's a good idea. Thank you so much. <laughs> Anything else? Eh, any comments regarding? Lindsay, regarding this uh, uh, comment. It's very important to talk about accessibility in the driver's special at the university. It is, it is important to consider accessibility. We have more and more students um, and you will probably have students who have not self-revealed. You may have colleagues who have not self-revealed um, who are afraid of some sort of retribution or backlash because they've, they're afraid that they're going to be seen as less because they admit that they have some sort of disability. So, you know, designing for that in mind, that universal design for learning, it benefits everyone, not just the person who has those needs. Do you have any tool that helps you evaluate your course, such as Blackboard Ally or any other platform? Um, I will say that we had Blackboard Ally when we used Blackboard. Um, we did not transfer it to Canvas because we found that it didn't work so well. I highly recommend WAVE, W-A-V-E, um, the extension. It does an excellent job of giving some visuals. Um, additionally, we do a lot of, we use the Canvas Accessibility Checker, the little blue man that's available in Canvas, but we do, we every tool that we use, we human check as well, because no matter what accessibility tool you're using, they simply do not catch everything. And you need to have human eyes on your documents. So if you don't have someone at your institution, you might consider training student workers to do that kind of work or getting contract workers. There are um, companies that you can hire as well. Great. Excellent. Uh, I also uh, remember everyone that if you want a certificate of participation, click on the link. This is a form that you need to submit your name correct name, a complete name, and your more than the name is very important that your email, the email that you submit there is correct because if not, when we send the, the, the certificates will be, will not be 
uh, it will be bounced to us. So please make sure before you submit the form, make sure the email is correct and your name is correct. So when you receive the certificate, everything is fine. Anything else? All resources are very important for Canvas of offline programs. Uh, Lee said again, thank you, Lee, for being so active in this chat. Any other questions? We still have two more minutes. So please, this is the time. Lindsay, in the meantime, people are thinking any other additional question. Thank you so much for your time the, and for also forwarding the presentation in a PDF format. It will be uploaded together with the link to the recording uh, during the next two or three hours uh, because we need to download first the recording from Zoom. And, and then the certificate will be sent by email with the link to the survey. If you were not able to do the survey uh, here, that you will find the link on the chat as well. You can uh, wait until, until the email with the certificate, you will have the link there with the survey as well. So. I saw I'm sorry, uh -huh. I saw a question from Jessica about STEM, oh, um, particularly with like diagrams um, with body parts, like muscles and bones. Um, Jessica, oh, yeah. I just did one of those for, I did the major muscle groups for kinesiology class. If you send me an email, I will send you the example of what I did working with our kinesiology people. We're actually working on a biology lab um, currently right now. And I will say STEM is very, very challenging, but I have some examples I can share with you. Um, I highly recommend um, bulleted hierarchical lists, hierarchical lists um, or uh, a table that offers the, the name, but I'm happy to share the examples that I've done if you just shoot me an email. Excellent. So Jessica said that would be amazing. Thank you so much. So Jessica, uh, you have he, uh, Lindsay's email. Uh, uh, Lindsay, if you want to share again the slide where you have your information. Absolutely. I was just going to say it probably would be helpful if I shared that slide. Yes. So, uh, so, so everybody can have your email. And also, again, thank you so much for your uh, sharing your expertise on this topic, there is her email, lindsay.nicholsfoster at dccd.edu. So please, and let me see if I can copy it and put it. No, because it's an image, but anyway. I can, I can type, type it photo. in the chat. Ah, I can okay. type it in the so, chat. That will be great. Too. <laughs> yes, because uh, I don't want I'll, to make I'll be any happy mistakes. To, I'll be happy. Yeah, it's easier if I just type it in the chat, so. Excellent, not a problem. But thank you again. Remember everyone that we have tomorrow another webinar, very interesting at the same time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so that's this time will be in Spanish and also, uh, 6 November 6 is the deadline for the call for proposals, please. Uh, we would love to highlight all the projects and, and resources and presentations uh, of the best practices in different uh, topics like retention, access to higher education and online learning. And also we have a new track for students because also students do a lot of projects integrating technology in the case of the students. It, it could be any academic field, the only a criteria is that that the project integrate technology so please make sure to help us uh spread the word and benefit of this opportunity of sharing your best practices and your projects that have been very successful implemented in your in, at your institutions and again Thank you so much. Uh, the ones in the US, the best practices is also an opportunity to meet Puerto Rico con and visit us on January. Uh, that here in Puerto Rico, we celebrate the longest Christmas time on the world. So you will have time to uh, see the festivities here and try our typical food also. Uh, go to the beach and and well, in the free time and and have a, a and being able to enjoy our nature because in Puerto Rico is summer uh, the whole year so. 
please also uh, take advantage of this opportunity and also meet your colleagues. And not only when we met uh, through the webinar, in these best practices will be in person. So everyone presenting their proposal and being selected will be invited to be here in Puerto Rico, uh, Bella, uh, sponsored by your institution. So please uh, don't miss this opportunity. Any questions, please let us know at info at heads.com. EDU. To conclude this webinar, Lindsay, again, thank you so much. Any final comment? Um, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Um, I had the opportunity to participate in the Best Practices Showcase last year. I highly recommend people apply to present. It's an amazing experience and um, it's you. a great it's a great learning experience so I did not get to go to Puerto Rico. I did the virtual but um, oh. but it, I, I got a lot of value out of the present out of the conference so oh Lindsay but maybe this time is your opportunity to come okay <laughs> I'll have so to talk to see. Dr. Morales about that. Yes, yes, talk to him, please. If you need my help, let me let me know. <laughs> so thank you again. Let me stop the recording since we already finished Bella. The recording.